Chapter 3. The Big Stuff. They found Grandpa Larry standing by a table of books. How much for this old set? A squally man w was asking. The encyclopedia, why it's a classic, it's not for sale, said Grandpa Larry automatically. And then what's it doing out here? The customer replied angrily. Fine, twist my arm, five dollars, said Grandpa Larry grumpily. And maybe I'll just, oh heck, twenty-five cents. Deal. The gleeful customer st started scooping up the encyclopedia volumes and tossing them into a cardboard box. Hey, Grandpa Larry, Cass tugged on her grandfather's sleeve. He was wearing a vintage Hawaiian shirt and a Panama hat, as if he were dressed for a tropical vacation. Grandpa Larry smiled delightedly. Cass, I didn't know you were here. Well, I didn't know you were moving, said Cass us. Dauntlessly. Didn't your mother tell you we're going to an all around the world cruise? Cruise for old people. You hate all that stuff. What do you mean? We are old people. I still don't understand why you have to sell everything. Are you going to be coming back? What's about my graduation? Grandpa Larry put his arm around Cass. You know as well as I do, this place hasn't been the same since Sebastian left us, he said gently. Cass nodded. Six weeks earlier, the ailing basset hound, who had survived long beyond the dire precautions of veterinarians, had died in his sleep. Cass, who loved Sebastian, as if he were her own dog, was unable to bring herself to visit ever since. All this stuff was bogging us down, Grandpa Larry gestured to the piles around him. And besides, you know what they say, you can't take it if you can't take it with you. Well, Cass tried to absorb what he was saying. Grandpa Larry turned to Max Ernest. Max Ernest, my friend, anything you want, I'll give you a great deal. It's called free, he whispered confidently. I have some drug books you'll like, and also a set of loaded die. Thanks, Grandpa Larry, said Max Ernest wistfully, eyeing the tables around him. But right now, um, Cass has a question. Oh yeah, said Cass, who was so upset she'd all but forgotten the purpose of the visit. Grandpa Larry, have you seen a big old trunk around here? You know, the kind with a lot of travel stickers? Larry looked curiously at Cass. That wasn't yours, was it? We couldn't remember where we picked it up. Figured it must have been one of those lost weekends in the 70s. Yeah, no, I mean, it's not mine, said Cass in a rush. But I just wondered if you had a trunk like that, because... We're doing a big unit on ancient Egypt in school and we're supposed to put together a box of all the stuff we would let take into the afterlife. Grandpa Larry left. After you're mummified, you mean. Exactly, said Cass. Max Ernest nodded, playing along. On Friday we're going on a field trip to the mummy exhibit at the Natural History Museum. That part at least was true. For an afterlife assignment, it had been turned in already. Well, the trunk I'm thinking of would be perfect. It's a time capsule all by itself, said Grandpa Larry. Last I saw, Grandpa Wayne was hauling it outside. Grandpa Wayne, who ha was dressed not in tropical finery, but in his usual grease-stained mechanics overalls, was in the middle of explaining that the electricities are repairing a 50-year-old black-and-white TV to a bored customer when Cass and Mass Ernest ran up. The customer hurriedly and gratefully excused himself. Grandpa Wayne remembered the trunk he had spent 45 minutes trying to open, the lock before giving up, and, but there were so many people coming in and out, he couldn't re remember whether he sold it or not. Try looking by my trunk. That's where all the big stuff is. The big stuff lying by Wayne's rusty old truck includes several marvels as a purple player piano, a tuba with a small palm tree growing out of it, a dry aquarium with a miniature pink castle, that home of a family of cockroaches. Unfortunately, there was no trunk in sight. Cass and Max Ernest looked around nervously, neither of them voicing their fears. What's Sebastian's bed doing here? asked Max Ernest, nodding at the threadbare dog bed laying by the truck open tailgate. Nestled on the bed was a ceramic cookie jar shaped like a bone. Next to the bed was a sign, not for sale. Cass bent down and sniffed Sebastian's bed. It smells like him. Mike Starris lifted the lid of the cook jar and quickly closed it. What moldy biscuits or something? Asked Cass something. 
What? Max Air spurned Lewis' face. Sebastian. Cass winced. You mean his ashes? Unless they were cleaning out the fireplace. Cass started, stared at the jar. They must be taking him on the cruise. Egyptian modification, their pets, all the time. It's kind of the same thing, said Max Ernest. I'll bet there are some cat mummies in the museum tomorrow. Hey, is that the trunk? The jester's trunk was laying in the shadow beneath the tailgate. Cass was re resisted crying ever since they arrived at the garage sale. The side of the trunk had her eyes welling with tears. What's wrong? asked Miss Ernest. Are you glad we found it? It's Sebastian. He always helped us find everything, and now, look, even when he's dead, he still is. Cass laughed and wiped her eyes with her sleeve. The trunk was much too heavy for the two of them to carry, all the way to Cass's house. So they decided they would get their friend Yoyoji to help them move it later in the evening. In the meantime, they pushed, pulled, heaved, shoved, lifted, dropped into the small cement yard behind the firehouse. Hopefully it would be safe for a few hours. Cass standing victoriously over the trunk, her face pink and sweaty. My grandfather's hardly ever come back here. As you can tell, he just she gestured to the long vines hanging from the fire fighter's old basketball hoop. Are you gonna open it? Dis distressed Max Ernest put his hand on the trunk. The layers upon layers of travel stickers and receipts. And addresses changed for formed a crust over the surface that made the trunk slightly forbidding, but all the more tempting. He couldn't believe he'd put all that effort and wasn't going to be rewarded with the peak. For all we know, this is our only chance. When we come back, it'll be dark, and then, okay, okay, Cass said, who, in truth, wanted to look inside the trunk just as Max Ernest did. Just don't ask any questions about, you know, I shouldn't have said anything about it. Then how am I supposed to help? You're not. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, but just let me ask you one question, said Max Ernest. I was thinking about the story of the doctor who discovered the it you remember. The pharaoh executed him after he told the pharaoh about the you know what. Cass gave him a look and said, yes, I remember, but no, I don't want to talk about it. He said the old He's the only one who wrote the papyrus, right? Cass nodded almost impatiently. You, do you think the papyrus was stolen from his grave? It must have been, right? I mean, how else? Cass glared at him. Max Ernest, do you want me to open the trunk or not? Yeah, yeah, okay. Equally impressed and dismayed, Max Ernest watched Cass work the large and complex combination lock that had systemed his months earlier. When they first tried to open the trunk. When she raised the trunk's lid, Max Ernest gasped involuntarily. Cass hadn't been exaggerating. Treasure was the right word. Instead, the trunk's coins, jewelry, and other precious objects sparkled and tantalizingly seemed as bright and shiny as the day the lid first closed on them. Wow, your great, 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 whatever grandmother must have been a pretty good thief. Yeah, she was, said Cass proudly. But she gave most of the stuff to the poor. I keep thinking there must have been a reason she and the jester left all this for me. Cass said, started pulling things out for inspection. Max Ernest regard regarded the objects with awe, almost afraid to touch them. At first I thought it was going to be to donate it, you know, for disaster preparedness or to fight global warming or child slavery, she said, peering into the gold candlesticks as if seeing if anything was hidden inside. But then I thought, who's going to believe it's mine? Cass opened the silver box and found that it was full of uncut gems. They were beautiful even in their raw states. No doubt very precious, but they didn't prove by what she was really hoping for. Another clue about the secret. Max Ernest turned his attention to the brass lock. He still couldn't get over the fact that Cass had managed to open it without him. He, not Cass, was supposed to be the expert in combination cracker. What Was she capable of finding the secret without him, too? Of course he wanted her to learn the secret. So much depended on it, and yet... Hey, did you see this before? He asked, examining the back of the lock. In pre 
perpetuate deeper into the trunk than might have been expected. The box struck to the inside of the trunk. Why? Well, I was wondering why the back of the lock was so big and then I saw that groove here. I'm thinking it might be he gripped the back of the lock and twisted and screwed the top of a jar. Come, come off like this, he said, now holding it in his hand. The back of the lock turned out to be a small box lined with cracked papery old leather. Inside was a gleaming gold ring tied to a strip of shredded linen. Look, I think it's Egyptian, said Max Ernest. You think it belongs to the doctor? Give, give that to me, said Cass quickly. Max Ernest reluctantly handed over the ring. Unexpectedly heavy for its size, it was molded from a solid gold and resembled a signet ring. On top was flat gold oval and veiled with lapis lazuli and brilliant blue stone flavored by the ancient Egyptians. For some, some of the stone had been chipped away, but enough was left to show the original image, a long beak bird presented in profile in the classic Egyptian style. Cass saw the bird and her pointy ears tingled with excitement. Hey, um, there is a hieroglyph, and it looks like this. Why does it look like one of the hieroglyphs you saw? Max Ernest knew that the secret was supposed to be Cass's, and Cass's alone. They had been warned repeatedly that it was dangerous for anyone else to share the knowledge of the secret, but it was impossible not to ask. Just answer the question. I thought you didn't want any help. Cass gave him a look. Yeah, it's a hieroglyph of an ibis, and the ibis worshipped by the Egyptians. So you see a lot of them, said Max Ernest, studying Cass's reaction. But it isn't always just an ibis, sometimes it's a symbol of Toph. Cass tried to keep her facial expression neutral. Toph. Remember from the spa, the good god of magic and writing and judge of de the dead. Years before, near the beginning of their adventure together, the god's name was pro proved vital for their quest to save Benjamin Blake from the Midnight Sun Spa. If you think about it, that would make more sense than any Ibis. This, I mean, it's supposed to be about immortality, right? Max Ernest thinks, but that's enough, okay? His mouth tightly closed and Max Ernest contemplated this unwanted and unexpected shift in their relationship with Cass. In the past, the quest for the secret how always brought the two of them together. We would either be the same way and wondered, or would the secret forever come between them? Avoiding his glance, Cass examined the ring. After the papyrus had turned to dust, Cass had the presence of mind to sketch the hieroglyphs in her notebook, but her memory was hazy and her knowledge of hieroglyphs was scant. At best, the hieroglyphs she drawn bore a sh shaky resemblance to the originals. During her studies of the Egyptian unit, she compared her drawings over and over again, but the hieroglyphs she'd seen, but with little luck. Before today, she succeeded in identifying and finding only the first two of the five hieroglyphs. They meant because and what or she thought they did. Now, thanks to the gold ring, she realized that the third hieroglyph depicted an ibis. She recognized the long curved beak and the rest of the bird, the football-shaped body and the atop and the stick-like legs, and had been, t had been too smudged to read, or at least for her recollection. It was too much and it didn't yet make sense. But the beginning of the secret, because what Ibis, or perhaps because what Toph. 